Uh, my family, I'm sure like your family, had rules. Like we, there, there were lots of rules. My parents kind of laid down uh, the rules. Some of them were like stated rules very clearly, like everyone knew it. Some of them were more subtle rules. But there was one rule that sort of permeated our family. It was something that got repeated, probably not daily, uh, but it was at least something that got repeated weekly. It was sort of like a guiding directive for our family. And I say rule, I mean, it is a rule, but it was more kind of a statement. It's a statement that might be familiar to a lot of you. Uh, my dad simply called it the kiss rule. Do you guys know what the kiss rule is? Anybody? Any brave person? Yeah, keep it simple, stupid. Like that was the family rule. Like it was like, hey, Keep it simple, stupid. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't make it difficult. Just make it simple, just easy to do. Just do it. Simple is repeatable. And it was just like this thing in our family, like don't overcomplicate things. And what's funny is as I've grown up, as an adult, there's like some things that I take, some of the family rules that I bring with me, some that I leave behind. But that's one of those things that I've always just kind of kept with me because I think it resonates with me. There's a part of me that loves simplicity. And here's the thing, I think for a lot of us, we're kind of the same way. Like a lot of us, we just like things simple. We like it to be clear. We like it to be concise. We like to know what's expected of us. And it's like, hey, if it's simple, if it's clear, then I'm going to do it. If it's not, then I don't even really know what's going on. I don't know what's expected of me. It can get overwhelming. Simplicity is sort of near and dear to my heart, and I think it's near and dear to the heart of a lot of us. Uh, as Katrina mentioned, we're kicking off a brand new series this morning called More Than a Children's Story. And over the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at these classic Old Testament biblical stories. Some of them you will know if you, first off, you've been in church, you will all know them. But if you're newer to church, some of them you may know, some of them you don't. Um, but I think it's a familiarity that we have with a lot of them for us that have kind of raised our kids in the church. These are the stories that we would have taught our kids. But what I want, my hope throughout this series is that we understand that there is truth from these stories that still speak to us in our lives today. Like what we read and what we've taught our kids, these are the things that still shape and form our lives today. It is more than just a children's story. And we're going to start off uh, today by looking at a story that is found in Genesis chapter 6. And I kind of set the preface up by, by talking about simplicity because I want us to see in this story how clear and at, at the same time how simple God's direction is in this story. The story I mentioned in Genesis 6 is the story of Noah and the ark. And we're just going to jump right in. So if you have your Bibles or uh, if you'd prefer to follow along the screen behind me or, your, uh, or inside the program, you can follow along there. But we're going to pick up uh, in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Uh, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, the text tells us, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so what we find here at the very beginning of this story is that there's a man named Noah who is upright, who is blameless, who does what's right in the eyes of God. Uh, it's not just Noah. Noah has a family. He's got three sons. His sons have families. Um, and as the story begins to unfold... Uh, Noah is held up in contrast to humanity. Essentially, Noah is blameless. He doesn't make mistakes, but at the same time, humanity has gone off the rails. Like uh, God created the earth. God had a perfect plan and intention for humanity. He had a, a tension, an intention for what the earth was to look like. And as we fast forward and the, and the story unfolds, it's all kind of fallen apart. God imagined, envisioned an earth filled with beauty, and at this point, the earth is filled with violence and destruction and chaos. And so God, he looks over creation, and he makes the, the call, he makes the judgment call, that he is going to wipe it all out. He's going to wipe it out, and he's going to start over. And that's hard for us to make sense of. 
Like, like we hear that, and again, if we don't just take the same old story that we know, if you think about it, like God creates humanity, God creates the heavens and the earth, God creates everything that fills and populates the earth, and yet in this moment, God steps back and makes the decision to wipe it all out. And one of the first things we can start to think is, well, like, why would God do that? Like, why would God wipe out all of humanity just to prove a point? And I think sometimes that's the conclusion we jump to, but nowhere in, in Scripture does it say God is trying to prove a point by doing this. Matter of fact, when you read through the story, you actually see in Genesis account, it tells us a lot about the grief and the turmoil that this brings God. Like God is not doing this to be vindictive. Like God, is, as he's doing this, it's, his, his heart is filled with sadness. He doesn't like what he has to do, but nonetheless, he comes to the reality that this is exactly what needs to be done. And I get, even as I say that, some of you are thinking like, Mike, no matter how you spin this, God still makes the decision to wipe out all of humanity. Like, that makes no sense to me. Like, if, if God is a good God, if God is a loving God, then how in the world does he just wipe it all out and start over just because he doesn't like what he sees? Again, even if he's sad, even if he's sympathetic to the reality, why would God do that? And that is a great question. And what I want you to know is I, I, there's probably not one single answer that is going to resolve that tension for you. But I do want to offer a thought. Maybe a way for you to see this story uh, maybe a little bit differently. Uh, and, and to get there, I want us to talk about a phrase that maybe some of you would be familiar with, some of you might not be familiar with. It is the phrase, just mercy. Have you guys ever heard that before? Raise your hand if you ever heard the term just mercy. That some of us have, some of us haven't. Some of us are like, that doesn't make any sense. Like how do you have just or justice and mercy, they are two incompatible ideas. How in the world do these two things go together? It doesn't make logical sense. Justice is when someone gets the punishment that they deserve. Mercy is when someone doesn't get the punishment that they deserve. And so again, how do you have like justice and mercy? How do they go together? But I want us to understand is that phrase, just mercy, really reveals the heart of God. It's what we see in God again and again and again, that, that there is a justice peace to God, that, that God has an intention and a plan for humanity. He has an intention and a plan for our world. And when we step out of alignment with that plan, God holds us accountable. He is a just God. Truly, it's one of the things most people like least about God. Right, like we want God to be our buddy. We want God to just do what we want to do. The fact that God would hold us accountable to his standard, most people don't like it. God is a just God. But at the same time, we see his merciful side. And that's really evident when you look at the life of Jesus. You see, what scripture teaches is scripture actually teaches that all of us have sinned. All of us fall short of God's perfect standard. And because we fall short, because our lives don't fully align with what God has called us to, there needs to be a, 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 a debt that's paid or a punishment that's paid. Justice needs to happen because we've missed the mark. And what that looks like is death. But because of Jesus, Jesus came to the earth. He gave his life on the cross. He surrendered himself, was laid in a tomb. We talked about this last week. Three days later, he overcame death for all people once and for all. Because of what Jesus did, we don't get death anymore, what we deserve. We get eternal life, mercy. Justice was paid through the life of Jesus. Mercy is what we receive because of God's infinite grace and love for us. Just mercy is exactly a reflection of God's heart. And that same principle we can apply here to the story of Noah. Like, well, again, if we look at it and we're thinking, why would God just wipe out all of humanity? It doesn't make sense. Well, here's what the text tells us. The text tells us that, that, that the world was spiraling out of control. 
that humanity was making decisions that was leading to death and destruction. That if the world and people were left unchecked, ultimately they would wipe themselves out. They would dismantle creation to some extent. And so God, in an act of mercy, does for humanity here in wiping them out what they would have ultimately done for themselves. But the gap between what they would have done for themselves and what God does in this swift act in this moment is that he prevents people from experiencing pain, relational pain, emotional pain, physical pain, as people are battling and warring against each other, as families are torn apart, as as loved ones are killed. Like, humanity would have had to go through that whole experience and the pain and the torment of all of it. But God, in his mercy, looked at his creation, saw where it was going, saw inevitably what would happen to creation, and decided to step in to prevent people from experiencing the ultimate reality of the choices and decisions that they were making. And so God says, I'm going to start over. I'm going to wipe out humanity. Every living thing on the face of the earth will be destroyed except for one person, one family. And many of you know that family is Noah and his family. And what God does as the story continues to unfold, God gives Noah very simple, straightforward, and clear um, direction about what he's supposed to do to preserve his family, but also more importantly, to preserve God's creation. This is what God says to Noah. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, it's very clear, 70 feet wide, 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and Upper. I mean, God lays out his plan for Noah. God tells him to build a boat. He makes it clear this is what you need to do. And Noah is like, What's a boat? Like, because at this point in scripture, there has been no reference to any boat anywhere. Now, the truth is, uh, Noah would have likely known what a boat is. Uh, a boat in that you know, region wouldn't have been uncommon. He probably has some reference. Maybe he hasn't owned a boat, but it's not just this completely foreign concept to him. <clears throat> um, but he's never seen a boat of this magnitude, right? It was a massive boat. Uh, roughly because, you know, we're, we're a football city. We like football. Uh, I'll give you kind of a reference. It's like one and a half football fields long. It's almost double football fields wide. I mean, again, you can kind of picture this. Put yourself in Lumen Field and just imagine the dimensions a little bit bigger on that field. And, like, that's the kind of boat that Noah is tasked with building. And Noah's probably thinking to himself in the midst of all of this, why do I need a boat? Like, okay, you've said you're going to wipe out all of creation. You haven't said how you're going to wipe out creation. You've just told me to build this monstrosity of a thing. Why do I need a boat? And as God continues, we see exactly why he needs a boat. God says this, look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. God says, look, you need the boat because I'm going to flood the earth. You need the boat because that's how you and your family are going to survive. And I just want to take a second to talk about this whole flood thing. Because I think for a lot of people, candidly Christians and non-Christians, 
this whole flood thing can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, it, it could feel even a little bit far-fetched, hard to believe. Like, like Mike, do you really want me to believe that flood waters rise, uh, r- rose across the whole earth? Like, that's the story we're going with? Like, that's what we want to, to believe? That's what you're calling us to believe? That, that feels like something children believe. But not adults, like we're smart, our minds are more formed and more sophisticated. We understand it's probably, it's impossible for a flood like this to impact the world. And no doubt, I, no doubt you're smart. You're all, I can just tell, I can look at your faces right now, you're all just brilliant. But at times, we don't know history as well as we should. And so while on the surface it might seem unfathomable, improbable, that there was a flood that wiped out humanity, that filled the earth, what I want us to know is that there is a significant number of early world civilization stories that involve a flood. And not like the Jewish people stories, like people from all over the world, they tell a story about a grand flood that covered the earth. Now, the the characters are different in the story. Some of the points of the story are different. But how is it that all of these early world civilizations have this narrative of a flood? Uh, Maybe I'm simple. Again, I like it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. For me, there's only really two logical explanations. Either one, all of the leaders of, of these civilizations in the, in the ancient world gathered together. They all, you know, like hiked, traveled. There was no like internet, planes, trains, automobiles, none of that. They somehow magically met in a centerpiece and they said, okay guys, listen up. Here's the plan. We're gonna, we're gonna write this story about a flood and we're gonna, we're gonna trick everyone into believing that there's a flood. Like as long as you say it and you say it and and you say it, and Jimmy, if you say it, everyone will believe it. So either they all gather together to sync up their stories to ensure that we can be fooled for all time. That could be one option. Or the other option is it actually happened. I mean, you know back then, you've read about it, I guess, or you've studied it in school, that there's no connection between societies in the ancient world. I mean, unless they're warring or battling, but you have these like different groups of people on different continents with the story of a flood. The only way that makes sense is for it to actually happen. Now, here's the thing. I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan of rational thinking. I think it's important to have rational thought, but what I want us to understand is rational thought isn't always reality. And this is one of those cases. Just because it doesn't make sense to us, just because we can't figure it out, doesn't mean it didn't happen. As a matter of fact, history shows us that it's a strong chance that this flood actually did happen. (coughs) And after Noah is told about the flood, God then tells Noah what he needs to, um, to bring on to the boat. God, God tells Noah what the boat is for. He says this in verse 18. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, Bringing, uh, bring a pair of every kind of animal, male and female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Uh, pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to, uh, will come to you and be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. But God says, look, this is what it's going to look like, Noah. This is what the boat is for. 
It is for you, it is for your wife, it is for your kids, it is for their families, it's for two of every kind of animal and, 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 and bird and wildlife, like all of them, it, they go on the boat. Now, I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm, I didn't grow up around animals, I don't really consider cats and dogs animals, they're more like many humans. I mean, for some, let's be honest. Anyways. I didn't really grow up around animals, and so I don't have a lot of, like, expertise with animals. But here's what I, I'm pretty sure of. Like, gathering animals is not an easy thing. Some animals are easier than others. The text tells us that there was kind of some assistance by God. But, like, just, just like, play this out. Like, if you've seen some of the movies about Noah's Ark, um, I think they give, like, an unrealistic vision of what this probably was like. Like, usually in the movies, it's like Noah and his family walking on the ark with, like, two of every kind of animal walking behind them and all the birds in perfect unisons flying into the boat, like, just as God intended it to be. Um, but, but there was probably a little bit of struggle, a little bit of wrestling, getting the animals together. I've never, again, I've never captured a chicken. I don't know if you guys have ever captured a chicken. Um, but I hear it's pretty hard to do. And so I imagine Noah and his family like running around, like trying to get these animals, trying to work, like get them on to the boat. They, eventually they sort of get everyone onto the boat is what we kind of see in the story. I'm sure, again, a lot of work. Um, uh, what I think would be true of what we see in a lot of the movies is that people would have made fun of Noah. Like they, I don't know if the movies do a great job of showing maybe the work to get the animals on the boat, but I think the movies do a great job helping us see some of the ridicule that Noah would have faced. I mean, think about it. For him, it barely makes sense. God's come to him. God says, build a boat. At the time, God doesn't even tell him what the boat's for. Oh, there's, flood. there's a flood coming. Okay, well, why does it need to be a boat this big? Oh, because you're going to fill it with your family and all these animals. And like all while this is happening, the building stages of this, like the community to which Noah is a part of is probably looking at him thinking, Noah, you have lost your mind. Like, I don't know what you're doing. You didn't go to Home Depot to buy lumber. Like, you didn't go to Johnson's. It's not where the lumber, like, you had to, like, actually mill the lumber yourself. Is that, what, is that the word, mill, right? Yeah? Yes. Again, if it's, if it's not at a home, a home improvement store, I'm, I'm lost. But anyways, so they have to get all the wood, and he's building up this ark. And can you just imagine the conversation? Can, can you just imagine the interaction Someone walks up to Noah, hey, Noah, what are you building there? I'm building a boat. It's going to be a beautiful boat, 450 feet long. It's going to be amazing. Why, why are you building a boat that big, Noah? God told me to. God said, hey, you got to build a boat. So I'm just doing what God told me to. And, and guess what? Guess what? God, God said I got to build this boat. And, and then it's just going to, the earth is going to flood. And then everything on the earth is going to die except what's in the boat. That's why I'm building the boat. You imagine the people in the community are like, oh, the earth is going to flood Noah. Is that what God said was going to happen? Right, let, let me guess. Let me guess. You, you built this boat. Just like God said, so when the flood waters come, then you and your family can get on the boat. And of course, all of us and our families that will get on the boat and our entire community will be saved because you were faithful to God. Noah, is that what's going to happen? Noah's like, no, 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 that's not. I mean, yeah, the boat is for me and my family, but not for you guys. You're all going to die. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to flood. You're, you're going to swim for a little bit. You'll eventually run out of energy, the doggy paddling. It won't be a great scene, but we'll be in the boat. You won't be in the boat, but hey, you know what? God did tell me to gather up some animals and put them on the boat, and I'm running a little short. Any chance I could borrow some of your animals to get? I mean, you're not going to need them anymore because, you know, you're going to be dead. Like, like, I just, what, like, what is this conversation like for Noah? Everyone has to think that Noah has lost his mind. And if I'm being completely honest, if I'm Noah... I'm not sure I'm in for it. Like, I mean, I get it, right? Like, God's kind of told me what to do. He's laid it out, very clear, simple instruction. But I don't know if I'm in for it. Like, I don't know if I'm in for the ridicule. I don't know if I'm in for the questions. 
I, I, I don't know if I'm in for a world that is wiped out. And then finally, when the flood waters recede, I'm left with me and my family. I love my family. But it's me and my family and a whole lot of animals and a ton of questions about what happens next. Like, I don't know if I'm in for it. But no, it was not me. And this is what the text says. In verse 22, Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Noah does everything just like God told him. God was clear. God laid it out. Noah did it. And I just don't know if I would have. Here's my question. Would you? Would you have built the boat? Would you have trusted in God's command? Now, here's the good news. You don't have to answer that question. I mean, the truth is, God promised that he would never wipe out humanity again with a flood. You're not going to find yourself in the same position or place that Noah was in. But in everyday life, we have to wrestle with that question. When God tells us to do something, when God commands us to do something, will we actually do it? And here's what most Christians will say. Most Christians will say, absolutely. I, I, I will do what God calls me to do. I will do what God tells me to do. It's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you're right, 100% right. But we also caveat it. We say, okay, I'm going to do what Jesus tells me to do as long as it's abundantly clear. As long as it's, it's, it's straightforward, as long as he's kept it very simple, as long as I know definitively it's from God, I need him to like appear to me and be like shining and white and say like, Mike, do this. And like, like, okay, then I would actually do it. Like that's what most of us say. Yes, yes, we'll do what God calls us to do. We'll do what he commands us to do, but it needs to be clear. But I think the truth is for most of us, Maybe all of us, that is just an excuse. You see, the issue isn't in God's clarity. And sometimes we're like, okay, God, if you were clear, if it was simple, if it made sense, then I would do it. The issue isn't in God's clarity. The issue is in our obedience. You see, you and I have an obedience problem. God doesn't have a clarity problem. We have an obedience problem. Because we'll say, okay, God, if it's clear, I'll do it. If it's straightforward, I'll do it. If, if I understand it, I'll do it. But until then, well, I'm just not going to do it. Yet the reality is God is clear. That God has been straightforward. That God is direct. That God has told us what we are to do and how we are to live our lives. And it's found in this book. Like, God, if you would just tell me what to do, then I would do it. And God's like, if you would just read the pages of my word, you would know what you're supposed to do. And I get it. Like, sometimes when we open up the Bible, it can be overwhelming. I shared this, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago, but uh, this year I'm reading through the Old Testament, and there are some overwhelming books in the Old Testament. There are some things that aren't always the clearest. Some things that don't maybe make sense. Culture's different. People are different. What's the application for us in our lives today? How does this all work out? There, there are, there's some of that in the Scriptures. But overwhelmingly, the Bible is clear. Overwhelmingly, the teaching of Jesus is straightforward and direct. Jesus says things like this. Love your enemies. But do we do it? 
Jesus says, forgive those who have wronged you. Deny yourself. Be a servant of all. Love God and love your neighbor. That's pretty simple. It's pretty clear. But do you do it? See, again, God doesn't have a clarity problem. We have an obedience problem. But what I want you to understand is it doesn't have to be that way. Like, we don't have to live lives that are in opposition with Jesus. But for that to change, truly for that to change for us in our lives, it begins with us admitting that there's even a gap to begin with. Like to have the honesty to be able to say, God, there are parts of my life that don't align with your teaching. There are parts of my life that look very different than who you call me to be, who you call us to be in your word. God, that's not a clarity issue. It's really a faithfulness issue. You see, sometimes I think as people, we like, we don't want God to know what's going on in our lives as if somehow we can hide it from him. But like, because we think, well, God is not going to understand. But change doesn't happen until we acknowledge what needs to be changed. Change doesn't happen until what's in the dark comes into the light. Change doesn't happen until we say, these are the areas that I've held back from you. And that these are the areas, God, that I'm inviting you to speak into. I'm inviting you to do something with. And once you identify that, once you acknowledge the areas in your life that don't align with the teachings of Jesus, then you can begin to change them. Then you can begin to invite the spirit of Jesus into your life to change you. Here's what we know. Nothing changes unless something changes. That we have to shift who we are. We have to shift the way we think. We have to shift the orientation of our hearts. We have to shift our day in and day out decisions and interactions with other people. And we do that by surrendering it to Jesus. Now I want to be clear, the issue here or the goal here isn't perfection. I'm not saying you have to live perfect lives. If you lived a perfect life, if I lived a perfect life, there would be no room, there would be no need for Jesus. The issue isn't Perfection, what I'm calling us to is to acknowledge the reality of where we need God to step into our lives. See, the truth is most of us, we pick and choose our faith. I've been in ministry now for 20 years. And I've encountered a lot of followers of Jesus who've been walking with Jesus for a season, maybe walking with Jesus for a lifetime. And they get to these moments where if they're being really honest, they're like, I don't know if anything in my life has changed. And maybe as I say that, that resonates with you. Maybe you're like, I've I've been doing this Jesus thing. I've been coming to church. I've been in a group like you tell me. I've been serving. I've been giving. Like I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't know if anything has changed. And what I've come to find over and over again, I, I see this to be true in my life is the reason why nothing changes in our life is because we are walking out our version of what it means to be a Christ follower. We pick and choose. We take what we want and we toss what we don't like. And we're like, I don't know why my life's not different. It's because you're building your life on yourself instead of building it on the clear teachings, the simple teachings of Jesus. Now, let me just make a comment here. Jesus' teachings are clear. His teachings are simple. But putting them to practice in our life is not always easy. And I think maybe that's where the disconnect is sometimes. Like to see the change that needs to take place in our life takes work. It's going to take work but I promise you, it's worth it. And so here's my challenge as I wrap up. My challenge for you this week is simply this, to look at your life. Like, do it today if you're afraid you're going to forget. Like, if Monday comes around and you think you're going to lose sight of this, like, do it today. Look at your life. 
Look at the areas of your life that don't align with the teachings of Jesus. And then simply invite Jesus into those areas. Willingly surrender them to him. Invite him into those areas. Invite him to shape and form that area of your life. And if you don't know what it looks like to shape that area of your life, you can find it here in his word. Identify where there's a gap and then surrender it to Jesus. And if you are here this morning, maybe this is your first time at church or you're not yet a follower of Jesus, here's my challenge to you. My challenge to you is sometime this week, literally look at your life Reflect on your life and recognize the ways, candidly, your life hasn't lived up to the hopes and dreams that you've had for your life. And as you sit in that space, I want to invite you to place your life in the hands of someone else. Put your hands in the life of the hands it belongs in. And that's God. One of the things I love about Scripture is, as Scripture tells us, and Scripture makes a promise that when we seek God with all of our hearts, He will show Himself to us. And so here's my challenge for you. Maybe this week, every morning, just simply say, God, show yourself to me today. Maybe in a real, tangible way, God, show yourself to me today and then keep your eyes open to the ways in which God shows To see change in our life, to see transformation in our life, takes work. But I promise you, if you put in the work, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, if you put in the work to form your life more like Jesus, it will be worth it. So take that step this week. Show the same faithfulness of Noah. Trust in God's word. Trust in God and allow his his teachings to transform you. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the story of Noah. And God, to see the way it challenges us, to see the way it encourages us, See how it's more than just a children's story. And God, I think in it, I recognize in myself, and probably for a lot of us, we recognize that that we have an obedience problem. So God, I pray that you would give us the strength to surrender our pride, to surrender our pursuits, to surrender ourself for the sake of you that we would form our lives, that we would allow your spirit to shape and form our lives more and more into the likeness of Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.